Oh, thank you, Pastor Dave, for that warm welcome. Uh, it's good to be here. A uh, long time since I've been here, so it's good to see new faces, lots of new faces here. And uh, I thank the Lord for uh, this opportunity to come and just to briefly share what uh, we're doing on the other side. Uh, you have been supporting me for many, many years, my wife and myself and my daughter as we've been church planting in Durbanville and uh, Durbanville North on that side of the world. And so, uh, we should have some pictures coming up uh, shortly. Uh, just have to check what's coming up. That's just an example of our church, uh, church service that we had. And, uh, we use the premises, the, the Durbanville Memorial Park, the dead center there. So I also get to do lots of funerals there. And uh, when we first went there and I found this uh, premises, or well, the Lord led me to there and showed us these premises, my mentor at that stage, Mark Lackwell Sr., nudged me and said, offer your services as the chaplain and I'll come and help you. I'm still waiting for that help, and he's left the country now. And uh, so 350, 400 funerals, I don't know. I love them. It's an opportunity for the gospel, and people that have never heard the message get to hear at such an opportune time when they're facing death. And so, um, yeah, my daughter, uh, that's my daughter, Amy, and her fiance, Christian. Uh, please be praying for them, um, particularly him. His uh, parents are going through a divorce uh, right now and he got that news about two weeks ago that really rattled him and uh, shaken him up quite a lot. So if you'll just remember him in, in your prayers, Christian, that God will strengthen the truth that he knows in his word. I had the privilege to lead him to the Lord some three and a half years ago. And um, so he has been growing, he's been discipled by a colleague, Jim. And, um, but he's really rattled at this stage. So uh, please, if you'll just remember it in your prayers. Okay. Uh, that's Jim and Terry, our colleagues, ABWE missionaries that work alongside us, particularly have a love and a passion for black ministry in South Africa. And they were working this side in Somerset West and uh, at a time when I was getting a ministry in outreach going into Fasanto Kral Township. They came alongside. The Lord's so amazing. Right at the right moment in time, He brings them along. And they've been working alongside in faith fellowship, in everything that we do, and in the, the township ministry. So we do ministry together. The last seven, eight years have been the best years of ministry, uh, working with them. And so they're a real encouragement to us. This young man, Tyron, uh, surrendered his life a couple of months ago. Uh, to full-time ministry, so we are training him for ministry. I tried to train somebody some years ago, got five years down the road with this person, and one morning got an email, cheers, we off to another church uh, that starts earlier and finishes earlier than yours. And I said, oh, wow, obviously did something wrong there, but uh, the Lord took him out, <clears throat> and I've waited for a long time now. And Tyron has come along, and uh, really a sincere young man, passionate about the Word of God, and uh, he's surrendered himself, and so now we're training him uh, for ministry. And uh, so this is the township ministry. <clears throat> this is our little youth group. We had to restart uh, because of COVID. We had to shut down our ministries. We had two outreaches into Fasanta Kral and into Blukomos, Wallerstein uh, townships. So we had to um, shut all that down during COVID. We've now started, we, we managed to buy a house in the township. We want to change that. We have plans in with the city right now uh, for the house. And uh, a week and a half ago, we spoke to a builder. Maybe not rebuild the whole thing, but maybe do uh, major renovations to this house in the township so that we can use it. On the side of the house is this little hall um, which could fit in about 50, 60 people. <clears throat> and we've started rebuilding the youth group again, Saturday afternoons, we're out there. And that gentleman leading there, the singing there, uh, is Alec. Um, and we're training him for ministry in the township. And um, so Bible studies at Alec's house on a Tuesday night, and Jim and Terry run that now. 
And uh, so <clears throat> this is just a little group, and each week you see different faces, and so it depends if there's soccer on the go or whatever. But uh, we're rebuilding. At one stage, we had 120 kids coming to that ministry, and uh, we'd meet on the Sunday afternoon in the town hall. <clears throat> and then suddenly, just before COVID, they stopped coming. And we found out that there was a Sangoma lady in the township that told them not to come to us. Um, the Lord has taken her out of the picture, and uh, so we're hoping to rebuild that. But we first went in to do the renovations on the house before we start that again. So there you can see some of them. Okay. And that's the house. It's a corner plot, the house in the middle, and then there's this like hall thing with a roof that's like a sieve. But uh, <clears throat> we, we're going to get that replaced now before we really start and put a new roof right over the whole property. And then on the left side, make like a grassed area where we can put a bride, etc., a fake lawn, etc., and make an outdoor place and a place for them to come. And we'll just roof the whole thing in and then uh, make some alterations within the house and so we can use that hall. So we started raising funds for that. We bought the house um, through the help of Vision in Action Trust, and we've repaid them 100000 And the Lord, through efforts in the States as well, we're almost at the million mark now to completely renovate sorry, this property. So we are looking forward to that. This is a plan that's in for the city, but I don't think we're going to go ahead with that plan because that would mean pulling the whole house down and restarting with double deep foundations if we're going to do a double story in that place. So I think we're just going to go with a single story and do the, the renovations that we need to do and make it as secure as possible. That township has a reputation. Uh, it's an extremely wicked place, and uh, there's just crime all around. The house we bought from an apostle, so I got to meet a real apostle. Um, <clears throat> Unfortunately, not a biblical apostle, uh, because I asked him, I said, how do you teach people in your church to get saved? Now, he's been teaching in that little hall for 20 years, and he said, you need to keep the law. I said, sir, you haven't kept one of the laws of God, not once in your life, every day, not one of them. And he looked at me quite shocked, and then he said, oh, well, then your last chance is at the great white throne. And I said, well, if you are standing before the great white throne, which I believe right now you will be, should you die, if you believe this, uh, then you are on your way to a lake of fire. And that shook him a little bit. Nothing in his vocabulary about Christ whatsoever. How sad. How tragic. But unfortunately, this is all these churches. There's a hundred churches in that township, and they're after their money. And that's all they are. And they're robbing these poor people blind, but they're not getting the truth. Okay. Is that it? That's the last one. All right. So we are busy trying to establish a, a church there that will teach truth and give them the Bible. And they all have Bibles. And whoever comes, we give them a Bible. And we're there to teach the truth, the truth of God's Word as we are doing at Faith Fellowship in Durbanville North. And then uh, during the COVID time, my family got COVID. Uh, I was the one, unfortunately, ended up in the hospital. Um, I know Pastor Dave had it. Uh, I got it, went into hospital, was going downhill uh, pretty fast. And um, when I was at my worst, um, I was meditating. Other people have been praying for me all around the world, in fact. And I thank God for each and every one that prayed, and I thank you for your prayers uh, during that time. And uh, my colleague, Jim, was sending me messages, and uh, a verse stood out for me. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, Do not fear, I am with you. Do not anxiously look around you, especially when this man passed away next to me. Do not anxiously look around you. I am your God. And then on the, the, I started meditating on these verses, uh, uh, this verse, and I began memorizing it. And right when I was at my weakest point, 
And um, he said, surely, I will strengthen you. Surely, I will help you. It was as though the Lord was standing there right next to the bed. And the next morning, the doctor came and I said, I'm going to be all right because the Lord was here last night and told me this. And he was a born-again believer and he said, let's wait on the Lord. And uh, I started coming, getting better. And a week and a half later, I was out of hospital. And I can only thank God for that. The last part of the verse says, Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And there's not a day that goes past that we do not, um, thank you, brother, that we do not depend on the Lord for, for everything that uh, we need in life. Uh, we need His grace to do the work that He's called us to do. And so I said to the Lord, well, thank you for sparing my life. And uh, do, we, do I just get on with doing what we're doing? And I'm sure that, yes, I will get on doing what we're doing, planting these churches, training these men. And then uh, the pastor of the uh, Tekeback Baptist Community resigned. Suddenly another church that supports me. And of course, because they support me, they came running to me and said, will you be the interim domini there? So I guess not an intersentate domini by Tekeback Baptist Community. And I have to laugh because the Lord has such a sense of humor. I let no angles of Germany. So um, I'm preaching in English, in English arms, you know, like Afrikaans, in a mixed uh, thing. And I, uh, I'm telling you, tongues are alive because sometimes the words come and I don't know where they're coming. And I'm preaching along in Afrikaans and I say, Lord, <laughs> thank you, but keep it coming. Because... Um, Really, and, and what, a, what a blessing that's been, an encouragement to my heart. God is raising up a man, I believe, for ministry. It's going to take time to train him. And that man has taken off. He's sharing the gospel with anyone and everybody. And that's the way we're going to grow the church, by sharing our faith, inviting people in, teaching them the truth, perhaps leading them to Christ. And his name's Jacques, and... Um, <clears throat> I meet him each week. In a couple of weeks, he's going to be preaching his first message. And I'm looking forward to that. And he led his son to the Lord this week. His son is 14 years old, Daniel. Sat him down and shared the gospel with him. Took him through it. And he was saved. Um, <clears throat> my sister lives in the UK. And she came out this week. And uh, she's the only one saved out of the family that are over there. But she brought my great nephew with her. Uh, he's 14 years old as well. And um, I had the opportunity to share the gospel with him. And then Pastor Jim came around and we sat him down together and we took him through the gospel again. And he accepted Christ. And so we thank the Lord for that. God is still saving people. That's why he hasn't come, because he doesn't want anyone to perish, but everyone <clears throat> to come to have eternal life, to know Jesus Christ, to put their faith in Christ alone. But what happens when you're tossed about by the events of life? What happens when storms come into your life and you're not quite sure, and your faith is being tested, your faith is being battered from one side to the other and you feel you're going this way then you're going that way how do you get the, the the compass to come back and point to christ i thank you for the hymns that we sang this morning behold our god reigns <clears throat> how do i get my compass back on jesus christ and get my faith rock solid on the anchor that is jesus christ Especially when the devil is trying to move it this way, that way. If he can just get it off one degree, he's quite happy. If uh, the flesh that is trying to go in the opposite direction of the Spirit of God can get you one degree off, well, then the flesh is one. If the world can get you going this way, that way. I think in COVID, I've never heard so many conspiracy theories in my life. And sadly, they were coming in on a daily basis. Watch out for this and that and that and that and the vaccine. And oh, my goodness. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, um, 
that ivermectin story and the whole story every day, even, but it's funny, when I got into hospital, they went quiet, <laughs> very quiet. As soon as I got out of hospital, oh, it hasn't stopped now with the vaccine story and all of this. Well, what I do know from Scripture is you cannot die before the Lord allows you. He has set the boundary of your life on earth. And there's nothing that's going to take you. It doesn't matter what it is. And we're all going to die someday. Not die, fall asleep in Christ and be with Him for all eternity. So, are we getting tossed to and fro by these conspiracy theories? How many are affected by the war in um, Russia, Ukraine? I've had so many WhatsApp messages. Is this the end of the world? What's happening? Is this this prophecy coming true? I said, no, Jesus said there are going to be wars, rumors of wars. That's all. Get on and serve the Lord. But you see, all these things can push your compass one way or the other. So I want us to come and look at Psalm 93. Come look with me at Psalm 93. <clears throat> and this psalm has been a great help to me to get that compass point back on to where it's supposed to be. And as I said, these hymns this morning, just uh, the songs we sang, just fitted straight into this message. First words, the Lord reigns. You see, God is on the throne. God is sovereign. He has established his throne, Psalm 103 says, and he is the sovereign God of this universe. You want to know where Jesus is? Well, he lives within us, but where is he now? He's on the throne. He's seated on the throne. What is a throne? The throne is the seat of all power. It speaks of power. It speaks of authority. God is ruling this world. <clears throat> it might look like evil is winning the day. No, no. God is still on the throne, and all things are working just as he appointed them to work. The Lord reigns. He's clothed with majesty. The Lord has clothed and girded himself with strength. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. Jesus said to his disciples, or we read it in, um, let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4. We read in there after telling us that the word of God is alive, sharper than any two-edged sword, etc. We read there in verse 14, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, our faith, our confession of faith in Christ alone. Hold on to it fast. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. <clears throat> Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Have you ever thought about that, what that means? What does that mean to you, to draw near to the throne of grace? Because that's what he's saying. He's saying, come to the throne. This throne on which God, the God of this universe sits, where Christ is seated at the right hand of his Father, Jesus is inviting us to come to that throne. <clears throat> if you want to see the throne, look no further than Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. Verse 2, this is John having the revelation. He gets caught up into heaven, and he says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting on the throne was like a jasper stone, 
and a sardius in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and upon the throne I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their head. Out from the throne came uh, thunders, flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. <clears throat> there were seven lamps of burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And it goes on to describe this enormous throne. The first thing that John sees as he goes into heaven is this throne. <clears throat> now, it's not a little throne because we see lightnings coming out of this throne, thunder and lightning and all these things. Spirits of God are before the throne. We are told in Revelation there are myriads of angels around this throne. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah sees a vision of Christ on the throne, high and lifted up. His train filled the temple, <clears throat> his robe. Above him stood the seraphim, crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of his glory. In Revelation chapter 4, we also read that there are these living creatures which are on the crystal sea around the throne, and they also cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. <clears throat> You're invited in there. Anytime, day or night. Why? And he says you can come boldly into this throne room. And these living creatures that stand on the crystal sea, we read, are covered in eyes. You see, there's nothing sinful that is going to get in there and get past them to the throne that is not invited to come. We are invited to walk into that throne room and to go boldly up to the throne for what? To ask for grace, to help in time of need. Now, if I had to ask you this question, when was the last time you shared the gospel with somebody? I wonder how you would answer me. This week? This past week? This past month? This past year? During COVID? You see, we have opportunities every single day of our life to share the gospel. <clears throat> what do we need to do that? We need grace. If you feel, ah, oh, I'm too timid, that's not for me, I can't do that. Yes, with God's grace, you can do that. <clears throat> and he says, in time of need, come to the throne, ask for more grace to help you. And you'll be given grace. I took my nephew to, <clears throat> the, to the waterfront, we were walking around, and there was that reptile trailer there. And uh, he wanted to see the snakes, poisonous snakes, etc. And so I took him in there. There was a man in there, uh, who obviously he owns it. He told me he owns it. But what a sad story of life he was giving me. Oh, and life's this and life's that. And ever since this, he has this and he's struggling and he's trying to make a living and everything. And I didn't realize that my nephew had gone down and he was looking at a green mamba in the cage and it was quite active, it was going up and down. And he put his finger on the glass, you know, don't touch, but we're all sinners, so. <clears throat> and right then he got a static shock and he thought the snake had bitten him. <laughs> so he put his hand in his pocket and he came out to the guy and says, that snake here now, how poisonous is that snake? The guy said, well, you've got a few minutes to live if that snake, <gasps> he was like, Almost having a heart attack there, and uh, <laughs> till eventually he got his figure out. He said, oh, and he said his mind was playing tricks on him. How could that thing bite him through the glass? But oh, they got a shock. <clears throat> I think that helped him accept the Lord the next day. But uh, <laughs> so I say thank you to the Lord. But this man I asked him straight out, I said, Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, no, my story starts then, and that, 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 that. I said, Have you ever been bitten by one of these snakes? No, no. I said, what if you were to be bitten by one of these snakes? Do you know where you're going? <clears throat> now I've got all my affairs in order and I've taken care of my life and everything. I said, but do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Now we get in hot water. Thank you, brother. Ah, oh, that's better. 
Okay. My wife knows me. Yeah. Sorry for the croakiness. Um, but he had a whole story. And he just wasn't biting on the gospel. And um, I left. But I think I'm going to go back to him and take him a track to read and sit and read. Because, wow, he has no hope. We are living in a world full of people that have no hope. They have no eternal hope. They hope tomorrow that COVID's gone. Don't we all? Okay? They hope tomorrow is going to be a better day. They hope the next day is going to be a better day. They hope they're going to make it through the week, but they have no eternal hope. And he had no eternal hope whatsoever. It's tragic. And I pray that each one of you sitting here this morning has the eternal hope. There is only one way to have that hope. You see, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You either have Jesus Christ, you've either been baptized by the Spirit of God into him when you believed that Jesus died to pay the penalty for your sins. He did that personally for you, but also for the whole world. And when you believe that and ask him to save you, believe it in your heart, able to confess it with your mouth, Call upon the name of the Lord. He will save you. <clears throat> Sharing with my nephew, he got that wrong. I said to him, would you like to accept Christ? Is there any reason you can't? He said, yeah, but you've got to take me to church and I've got to get into church. I said, no, 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 no. Took the Bible out, got out Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not by works lest any man should boast. And he read that. <clears throat> he said, okay, let me read it again. And he read it. And he said, yeah. It's by just believing in him. I said, yes. You have to do that first. And that is the only way to get into heaven. Now, if you're saved, you know that. And we need to tell others that. Because to not take it for granted that they are saved. I've also picked up a Bible study in a retirement village. And um, that's grown faster than any church plant <laughs> that I've had. It's, uh, I have these uh, old dears that are coming, and I've got testimonies out of all of them coming out of all different walks of life and everything. I took them through a panoramic overview of the Scriptures. None of them had seen that. None of them knew the story of the Bible from beginning to end. They'd never seen it like that. They'd never heard it. They just knew of the stories in the Bible. But uh, they had testimonies of faith. <clears throat> but now I'm, it's an English Bible study, but now I'm getting Afrikaners coming. I don't know where they heard that I'm an Afrikaans Germany. But anyway, they come in now. But they, the reason they come in, he said, that Germany down there doesn't believe the truth, the Bible anymore. They're teaching the opposite of what this says. Now, Psalm 73, uh, 93 says, The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their voice, <clears throat> up their pounding waves. This is a very noisy world that we live in. And the world wants to mold you into its philosophies, to believe the way it believes. We're living in a postmodern world which says there is no such thing as absolute truth. That's not truth, they say. There's nothing that's absolute truth. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. The biggest sin in the postmodern world today, do not try and impose your truth on me. Let me alone. It's selling it to everybody in the world. It's selling itself to our children, <coughs> our grandchildren, it's selling itself out there that you can do what you want and be what you want and nobody has the right to tell you that that is wrong. Now, if you buy into that, 
then you're going to stop believing the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 6 says this. In verse 9, 1 Corinthians 6, oh, sorry, let me just get it here. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Paul wrote in Colossians, Do not be taken in by the vain philosophies of this world which are teaching untruth. The anti-God philosophies of the world that tell you you can be all right. <clears throat> you can be whatever you want and God will just accept you. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, that's sex outside of marriage, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And the Domini at the old age home is saying, all these things are right now. You can be what you want. Why? Because the church that he comes out, one of the Dominis there, out of the couple that are there, is gay and got married the other day. So you have to throw that out. You have to throw out Romans chapter 1. You have to throw out the book of Leviticus. You have to throw out Revelation. Because Revelation 21.8 says, immoral people will not be in heaven. Such were some of you. But you were washed. You see, what's needed is to be washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. If you are not washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, by putting your faith and realizing <clears throat> that on that day Jesus died and shed his blood, he did it to wash away your sins and fit you for heaven so that you can go to heaven. This body can't go to heaven. It has sin in it. Okay, we learned that this morning in the catechism. This body has sin, but your soul, your spirit, which is sealed by the Holy Spirit on the day of your conversion, that goes to heaven and you're clothed in a glorified body which cannot sin and will never fade or perish in any which way. We have to be washed. In other words, you have to come to Christ and realize this is sin in my life. And if we are not going to say that, that that is sin, how are they going to get saved? But everybody's keeping quiet. We don't want to offend anybody. So we don't preach on this anymore. We take it out of the Bible. We just shoo it away. And we say, God is love and God is just going to accept you and you'll be okay. That is a false gospel. And we need grace to be able to say to people, your lifestyle, no matter what it is, and I'm not singling out any one of these things, believe you me, it's not just one of those things. And I'm sure we can all see ourselves somewhere in there. But such, as such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified, declared righteous by God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. I said to somebody the other day, who are you listening to? You're listening to yourself, the world, the devil? Be careful who you are listening to. This is absolute truth. We read that scripture, as uh, Pastor Dave said, you know that passage well. All Scripture is inspired by God. This entire Bible, from beginning to end, is God-breathed. And Peter says, pay, we do well to pay attention to it, as to a lamp shining in a dark place. We live in a dark world. This is not heaven. We're on our way to heaven. Truth. Absolute truth. 
is what the world needs to hear. And we ought not to be ashamed to go out and tell it to people. The world can make noise. And they are making noise. And you can go on social media and it's all anti-God, anti-God, and this philosophy and that and that and it's pounding. He says it's like pounding waves. But if you think of a wave that comes crashing against the rocks, what happens? Turns into foam, dissipates, comes to nothing. And then he says here, in verse 4, Psalm 93, More than the sounds of many waves and the mighty breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. We read Revelation chapter 6 to 19. <clears throat> the world is raging against God, worshiping Satan, worshiping the devil, raising, raising their voice against God. What happens at the end? Destroyed. By who? Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, as he takes back control of this earth and establishes the millennial kingdom for a thousand years. We are not living in the millennial kingdom. Firstly, it's been going 2,000 years. Millennial is 1,000 years. The church has been going 2,000 years. So we are not in the millennial kingdom yet. And your frontline newspapers will tell you that you're not in the millennial kingdom. Okay? We are looking forward to that. Finally, he says there in verse 5, your testimonies are fully confirmed. There are some, John Bunyan said there are about 50,000 promises in the Word of God. And you cannot take one step without treading on one of those promises. Now, I'm not going to ask you how many you know, <clears throat> but the Bible is full of promises that God has made. And we can live by them and we can trust them that God will keep every single promise that he has made in his word. Do you trust your Bible to be absolute truth? Jesus said to the Jewish disciples who were following him, he says, you want to be followers of me, you have to keep my word. Keep my word. And then he tested them. He said, well, if you drink my blood, eat my flesh, uh, they were running away. Do you really believe this book? Is truth, absolute truth. And whatever God says to you in this book, he will do. And he's able to keep every single promise. Watch out. The devil is more crafty than any other creature. <clears throat> and his ways are deceptive. Very deceptive. And it might look like the whole world is saying, yes, we've got to accept all of this. We've got to cancel culture. We've got to go woke. We've got to go all this. And all that. Watch out. If the masses are running that way, you want to be going that way. Go out of the city to Jesus. Go away from the crowd. Make sure you're following Christ and Him alone. You see, what's it all about? He says, your testimonies are fully confirmed. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. And I'll close with this, Revelation 21.8. So that we're absolutely sure on this. This is right, second last chapter in the Bible. <clears throat> Talking about heaven, the great white throne judgment has just happened, and all those who have rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as the Christ, have been sent to a lake of fire for all eternity, <clears throat> along with the devil, the demons, the whole lot, are in a lake of fire. And he says this in Revelation 21, 8, But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake. <clears throat> that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That will not be in heaven. Don't be deceived. Your family, they may go to church. Have you checked out their salvation? Are you absolutely sure? 
One of the Afrikaans ladies asked me to see, to see me. She's 92. <clears throat> and after I taught a Bible study, she said, uh, I have some doubts. Can you come see me, please? And I went to see her, and I sat down with her. And she had taught the Bible in, the, in Gierkirk. And she said to me, so it starts out with, you've got to be christened. And then do the katkasasi, and then you'll become a Christian. I said, I'm sorry to tell you, but that's not in here. You won't find that in here. And I explained to her the gospel. I said, it's by faith in Jesus Christ alone that will save you. That's the only thing that can save you. Christening is a work. Doing katkasasi, catechism, is a work. It can't save you. You can't add that to what Jesus did for you on the cross. And she said, no, but I have done that. So I said, no. Well, if you have, then you are saved. And that is fine. So you cannot take it for granted if you have never asked the person, are you saved? Don't take it for granted that your parents are saved. That your children are saved. That your friends are saved. That your work colleagues are saved. You need to ask God for the grace that you can initiate a conversation and ask, what do you believe in? How would you get to heaven? On what basis would you go to heaven? And listen for the answer. And if it's works-based, you need to tell them, Actually, the Bible says otherwise. Let me show you and share the gospel. Why hasn't the Lord come? Because he doesn't want anyone to perish. And as long as we have breath in our lungs, we're still able to accept Jesus Christ. We're still able to share. When I was in the hospital, this person passed away, and I was lying there. Next thing, uh, the curtains were pulled closed. Another man came into the ward, and I heard them, and they were discussing him, and discovered that he had a tumor on his spine. And that's why he's there. He couldn't walk anymore. And um, <clears throat> so then they opened the curtains and everything, and I'm lying there, and I'm praying, Lord, will you give me an opportunity to speak to this man? This man? And um, they opened the curtains and everything, and I'm lying there. And he looked over to me and he says, wow, that's quite a bad thing. Eh? And there was the opening. He opened the conversation. And I was able to talk to him, share the gospel with him. And um, the next thing they came running back into the ward and they said, but you don't have COVID. And uh, they quickly did a, the, you know, those... Um, Pathke came running in there, did the test, ran in, then they came running back and they said, no, you don't have COVID. And they all went running out to find another ward. And I turned to him and I said, this did not happen by chance. This is not a mistake. God put you here so I could share the gospel with you. And then he went off <clears throat> and he stayed in touch with me through WhatsApp. And he started getting better and they got the tumor shrunk and everything. But in that time, between then and now, he accepted Jesus Christ. His wife is a believer. And um, he said, um, a few nights ago, he's got now tumors in his esophagus. So uh, she told me, and I went to see him in Kells River Hospital in the ICU. And he said, you know what? I should just tell my wife, oh, yes, now I believe in Jesus because I wanted to get her off my back. And... Uh, he said, you know, I used to go to church, but I'd sit there and say, when is this guy going to finish uh, talking? <coughs> and, um, but he says, you know, suddenly the Lord told me and showed me, convicted me, sir, you have no hope. And he said, that brought me to my knees, and I asked Jesus to save me. And uh, I don't know what the outcome of this is going to be with the, the tumors and everything, but when I spoke with him the other night, we sat there. We had the most wonderful fellowship. 
out. He knows exactly where he's going. His hope is in Jesus Christ. His hope that should something happen, he'll be in the presence of his Savior. Who is God bringing across your path? It's never an accident. And he wants you to share the gospel. May the Lord bless you and encourage you to step out with courage, with boldness, and start the conversation. If they shut the conversation down, it's fine. But he asked you to share the gospel. He commanded us to share the gospel, to make disciples of all nations. May the Lord bless you. Thank you. Amen.